my name is Gleb, I'm from Belarus. Uh, we run an open data group uh, in Minsk and um, there are several dozen, probably around yeah, more than 100 people participating, mostly students, uh, researchers uh, from scientific libraries and um, there are some journalists. And we are trying to find sources of data that will help uh, to understand what's happening in our country and how to deal with social and civic issues. Um, according to Open Data Barometer, the situation with open data in Belarus is pretty bad because we are 93 out of uh, 115 countries uh, surveyed, which basically means that there is some data that the government is uh, collecting, but it's not sharing almost anything. And the problems are basically that uh, even if there is data, the government either wants to sell it because uh, it costs them money to produce it, or uh, sometimes uh, the people who are in charge are overloaded and they just don't want to be responsible for any mistakes that are in the, in the data. There is no freedom of information uh, legal framework, just no law at all. And we cannot file freedom of, freedom of information uh, requests. There is a procedure for ask, uh, to ask for basically a response from the government, but uh, it can come as you know a printed letter uh, saying this data could be available, but it, it's not. So they're not responsible. Uh, um, and most people, like journalists and uh, researchers, don't know about Wikidata, OpenStreetMap, and we are trying to change that. Oh, and there is a special case. Uh, uh, some of the data is closed as national security uh, stuff, basically KGB archives and archives about uh, whatever was happening during the USSR period. Um, so, yeah, I just want to give a bit of background about the country. Uh, it's basically the population of New York City uh, in terms of population size. There are two official languages, Belarusian and Russian, which makes things a bit more complicated because uh, we have uh, one alphabet but two variations, so special characters. Uh, when you work with archive data from, let's say, 100 years ago, you have five or six or seven or eight languages that were in official use. Um, Basically, there are no minorities because everyone is multilingual. So, in my family, we speak four languages because uh, grandparents were from four different communities. And the cities uh, which had traditionally more uh, scientific data collected and archive data uh, saved were traditionally Jewish, Polish, and Russian. And uh, the titular nation, Belarusian, was less. Uh, you had less access to education and it was concentrated in the rural areas, so it's much harder to find information about uh, non-Russian and non-Polish and non-Hebrew sources. And, um, and it's all changing very fast, basically. In a matter of decades, it's been changing as uh, there were waves of migration before the Soviet Union disintegrated and after that. But, um, it's, it's a really interesting place. So you could say it's a flyover country because um, when people track planes uh, flying over Minsk, most of them are just passing through Belarus, over Belarus from Russia and Asia over to Western Europe. And that's an actual picture from flight radar. And uh, despite that, it's, it's an interesting place to explore. And, um, and I'm sure that the situation is really, really different from where you come from, but I think there are some similar problems and similar approaches that uh, maybe could be interesting. So, just as a random art example of using data as art, um, people in our community looked at the map of Belarus and switched, uh, split it into polygons and uh, looked for geographic names like river names and uh, village and city names and in the patterns uh, that are contained in those names and it turns out that uh, those patterns contain data about the list of people who live there obviously and uh, there are local uh, references to animals and things like that and you can group them and it's kind of an interesting data set to play with so all the data comes from OpenStreetMap containing uh, 23,000 uh, location names 
and it's just interesting to see how Baltic, for example, place names are concentrated in the north, uh, so places closest to the Lithuanian border, and uh, here are places that contain more Russian-specific um, suffixes. Yeah. So it's not true that there is no data, there is some data and it's uh, interesting to discover it. And uh, this is more like, this map is uh, more Belarusian language oriented suffix uh, on the map of Belarus. And so uh, about less art and more data oriented projects, we try to get civic data out of news reports and press releases from the police, from the government ministries, and sometimes when the bureaucrats are feeling lazy, they use the same template, so uh, they use the same kind of sentence over and over again, and we try to parse that uh, for actual numbers. Um, I'll show some examples later uh, from the police reports. Uh, we try to look at municipal services, uh, so the hotline uh, reports about uh, like uh, curb, uh, broken curbs and uh, illegal parking and things like that. We look at maps of uh, transportation, because public transportation is really big in Belarus, and most people use it. Um, we look at um, environmental data, and it's really important in Belarus because, um, um, well, it's, uh, it used to be a mostly rural uh, country. Uh, most people lived in, uh, in the countryside up until the 80s. So, uh, the landscape is very, very non-urbanized and um, the population density is kind of low, so most of the land area is forests and um, uh, wetlands. We also look at uh, how public transportation is given uh, way to uh, private cars and car ownership. And we also try to extract data about um, house ownership because it um, is basically the and apartments, obviously. Uh, the, best, the best way to understand how our cities are changing. The government doesn't publish enough urban data, so we're trying to understand this from uh, uh, classified ads, for example. Uh, we try to work with commercial data as well, because the companies accumulate more and more data even compared to the government uh, uh, services nowadays. And we try to use as much open source uh, data sets as possible from OpenStreetMap and Wikipedia and try to popularize that. So that's an example of uh, government data that we try to parse. And the animation in the first pre-slide was uh, from us trying to parse the official zoning map of Minsk, the major city, into polygons and to understand uh, what the population density was in different parts of the city. And we actually get this as JPEGs. That's the best you can get. It's uh, kind of secret. You can only get it when you know someone in the ministry. But once somebody got it, uh, it was shared in the community. And the reason it's secret is because uh, people started protesting uh, against um, shrinking of green areas and parks and all the uh, public uh, places that were given uh, to commercial construction to um, foreign and domestic investors building um, shopping centers and uh, new apartment buildings and it's kind of a mess and the discussion process is really really a um, conflict point for the government so they don't want to publish any zoning maps, but we uh, try to get this data as, as much as we can. So, uh, about parsing news reports and police reports, uh, it's again the map of Minsk, but um, we had a parser running for three years that extracted every daily police uh, uh, press release report about all violent and non-violent crimes in, Bel uh, in, in Minsk. Uh, I think this data shows only, date, uh, only reports from one or two months, so the numbers are not that large. But it was actually useful. You could see uh, which areas had more crime and which areas had less. So, in general, the crime level is very low in Belarus. I think it's 
kind of comparable to Portland. Um, um, the number that stuck in my head is that the number of uh, murders in Belarus per year was lower than, than uh, in Baltimore. Uh, but I guess that's completely not a fair comparison, but uh, comparing the population gives you an idea. And here's another example uh, where we extracted all the human rights organizations' reports about uh, police uh, arrests and harassment during uh, protests and demonstrations, because uh, there were uh, major waves of demonstrations against um, government uh, austerity plans in 2017. So we extracted data about all the arrests and all the uh, punishments that were given to people. So 224 people were uh, given arrests uh, on average of around 10 days in jail. And around $250 on average uh, fines. So that's some information. That's a map showing the concentration of uh, people arrested in different places in Belarus. Um, another interesting source of data is uh, the traffic police reports. And uh, here, uh, I know it's I know the uh, visualization is kind of small, but we, we were just trying to show how different um, types of uh, traffic uh, incident reports were split between men and women. And uh, the blue uh, part is the uh, men in the, uh, who participated in the in incidents, and the uh, pink is uh, the women. And it's shown data from 2012 to 2015. It was just a random thing that we wanted to try out, and it shows all the incidents, incidents uh, caused by um, intoxicated drivers, so women are basically non-existent there, and incidents, accidents with um, injuries, and accidents with uh, fatalities. So yeah. Whenever there is a discussion online about uh, uh, women drivers and men drivers, and I, I don't know how popular this discussion is in this part of the world, but in Belarus somehow it's kind of very um, active. Um, yeah, it's it's an argument, and yeah, the the right part shows um, split by uh, age. So 19 to 23, 24 to 28, uh, 29 to 33, and so forth. So the youngest drivers caused the most uh, accidents. This is another view of the same data, and it shows the uh, number of accidents by day. Uh, so uh, this uh, line chart shows days and accidents peaks per day. And most of the peaks were either holidays or this, the first day after holiday, or there was one huge peak during the hurricane and the snowstorm that basically caused a lot of accidents. Um, and you can find other different things that uh, matter. Okay, and another major source of data is the municipal hotline data that they published completely accidentally. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, the government is trying to use a private company to build this portal uh, showing all the municipal uh, problem reports. And it's working really well. It's just that all the JSONs are containing all the data about people who report stuff and all the uh, reports themselves are completely available. <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, it's a huge data set and uh, it's growing. Um, it's not full yet because uh, right now most of the reports are submitted by phone and not by app and we only get the data through the reports that were submitted through the app. And actually they're really nice people. Uh, when we talked to them and we told them that all this data is available and they were like, yeah, we know. Uh, don't do anything bad with that. So. Um, so yeah, it's a picture, a nice picture of Minsk, and uh, it's showing all the requests that were reported through the app. 
and the actual number of reports reported through the phone through the phone hotline is um, a number of magnitude uh, larger but we don't get all the data there in the data set they're trying to switch to this new system but uh, it's really expensive because uh, the private company is using Oracle as a database and I think they're not aware yet how much it would cost. <laughs> um, and when we pulled this data set we tried to split all the, all the usernames uh, which contained first names. Um, we threw out the last names because uh, we didn't want to keep this personal data. Uh, so the first names uh, actually gave us the information about gender. So we tried to split how many reports were concentrated in different uh, categories of issues. So reports about um, sidewalks and about uh, problems with uh, um, like parks and things like that. And, uh, versus problems uh, with um, uh, staircases and doors in apartment buildings and things like that. And it turned out that uh, men were much more active in uh, reporting problems with sidewalks um, that were closest to bike paths. And uh, women were more active about reporting problems with um, infrastructure inside the apartment buildings. So that was some interesting bit of information. And it also gave us a, an idea about the difference in terms of uh, time that was spent on uh, correcting those reports. I haven't covered even one third of the data, but I think I'm almost out of time. Uh, so this shows the split by district in the city and how long it takes uh, different parts of the city to fix problems. It's all from the same data set. This is from the KGB data. It's completely unrelated to municipal. I'm just showing a map of... Um, we worked with human rights activists who um, collected data from the KGB archives and it's showing all the people uh, who were arrested and sent away to Siberia or to local prisons during the Stalin repressions. So um, the dots show places uh, with the most arrests per year. So um, there were waves of repressions and you can kind of see that. Um, we also use some pirate data uh, because uh, it's not possible to get all the data you want uh, officially. So Sci-Hub, which is the pirate uh, scientific database, and uh, made available some uh, download information about different countries. So we were able to see uh, what people by IP ranges, uh, what people from Belarus were downloading and what types of publications and what um, journals, uh, sections of journals, and different topics. And it gave a lot of interesting information that we published online as a, uh, actually a scientific uh, publication. Traffic data is interesting. Um, and we also run some uh, community and activist projects where people just go outside and measure uh, pollution in the local water sources, and we map that. I think you just have to download the presentation with the links uh, if you are actually interested or just talk to me later uh, because there's too much that I wasn't able to show. Um, and just one random source of informa information that was really interesting to use, uh, we downloaded all the uh, classified ads for the used cars in Belarus, around 200,000 uh, reports for a month. And we did it for five months and then we looked at the oldest cars uh, per city and um, the most polluting cars per um, 1,000 population in different parts of the country. And uh, it showed really significant variation because the oldest cars pollute a lot more and you can see it all from the classified data and from the address. Yeah, and uh, there is real estate data and there is density data and all of that uh, can be combined to gain insights in, into what's happening in different parts of the cities. And uh, when you use OpenStreetMap on top of that, you can actually see which parts of the city have uh, most uh, beer stores uh, per district and whether that correlates to the density, it doesn't. It uh, basically correlates to the number of um, cheapest apartments and uh, places where people don't have anything else to do. 
it's um, interesting how much data you can get out of OpenStreetMap when the state doesn't publish any, anything. And according to Tim Berners-Lee, actually made a screenshot from his TED talk, uh, this uh, circle shows Belarus on the OpenStreetMap activity uh, timeline. So I'm kind of proud. And we run an infographics school for seven years, uh, five years now, seven courses. Um, four months courses that uh, teach journalists and activists to use data and uh, most of the uh, screenshots were from things that people did in this school of infographics. Thank you and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. <laughs>